Well, I am here in Hawaii on a family vacation on the north shore of Oahu. Check out this panoramic view. Up near Sunset Beach. Beautiful sunny day. Very bright, so I hope you don't mind my sunglasses. And while my family is having fun elsewhere right now while I'm recording this live online, I want to do this in a very popular tropical island while I'm here. A place that's commonly known and popular for honeymooners and weddings. And not just that, of course. And wonderful vacations like I'm doing here now. I would like to promote, though, this very special, the greatest wedding rehearsal of all time. Actually, as an annual rehearsal for the greatest wedding and honeymoon of all time, if I may speak metaphorically, what I'm talking about is the annual prophetic biblical feast of Sukkot, also known as tabernacles or tents, as may also be considered a 1,000-year post-wedding honeymoon feast, which is the coming king, the Messiah, Yeshua, a.k.a most people know him as Jesus still. And as these annual biblical feasts offer the master plan of eternal salvation for all humanity who wish to repent and believe and obey the best we can with his help, with the Torah written in our hearts as part of the New Covenant prophecy and necessary to be in the New Covenant, as we see these feasts or shadows are also referred to as rehearsals of greater things to come in the future. They're prophetic, as the Apostle Paul, Shaul, hints to in Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Now, many of you are familiar with that. But this prophetic greatest feast wedding takes place sometime after a future Yom Teruah also known as Rosh Hashanah in Judaism, as they change the name a little. You won't find that in Scripture, Rosh Hashanah, in the Torah, in the written Torah. But when the Son of Man, the prophecy, as even Judaism knows, the Jewish rabbis, especially Chabad rabbis, know that the Son of Man will return in the clouds and his feet will first land on the Mount of Olives. And that prophecy is found in First found in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. We also see it in the Brit Hadashah writing, also known as the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 and 31. And you can look at the context there. Also in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, that he will return. His second coming will be as his first coming was departing after the resurrection. You read about that in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, and uh, look at the context there as well. Now, between that day, that Yom Teruah, that Feast of Trumpets, or Shofars, or Shouting, is the literal Hebrew translation, is shouting. It can also be with Shofars, or a great way to shout and make loud noises and, and actually penetrate sound waves, subsonic and supersonic, when a, when a good, inspired righteous person blows one properly with a lot of different notes and, and so forth. But that's a wonderful feast. But there will be a great wedding, the greatest wedding and honeymoon inauguration of all time following that future Yom Teruah, which connects to the feast, the rest of the fall feast, the atonement, Yom Kippur, and also the feast of Sukkot. 
Tabernacle. In case you didn't know yet, I am hosting one this year near and inside Yosemite National Park. 2019. Have you already seen any or all of the video promo sneak previews that I've uploaded onto YouTube? If not, please check them out. If you can't find them, let me know. Contact us at draftin.org. We're anyone peaceful, kind, and zealous for truth. Zealous, which also includes Torah. The written instructions of our Creator. Anyone can register online with draftin.org. You can go to the top left sidebar link as titled Register for 2019 Holy Day. And just fill out the questionnaire and more information will be sent to you. No cost and no obligation other than whatever reservations you want to make for the accommodations and the group rates that you can offer. But getting to this relative theme, this year we've decided to encourage a very relevant and a relative theme. Because we all want to be relative. We all want to be mishpacha, as the Hebrew word means family. The one body and the body of the Messiah as prophesied. A great wedding in the future with the Messiah. So... In the remaining video here, I feel inspired to expound upon the spiritual focus and theme of this coming 2019 eight-day feast designed for foundational learning and rejuvenating. Kind of like a, I'm giving a title if you like the letter Y or the Yud. How about Yosemite, Yeshua, Yeshiva for eight days with a theme as titled Bride Getting Ready. The 2019 feast rehearsal, we call it a rehearsal theme because the bride is not quite ready yet. It hasn't been ready. But the groom, the bridegroom, also referred to as the lamb, is ready and patiently waiting. Waiting for what? Well, as we see in Revelation, the book of Revelation in chapter 19, verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. So this is actually uh, the Apostle Yochanan, John, writing this about 1900 years ago, implying that the bride needs to be ready first, beforehand. To what degree? I don't know. I don't have that revelation yet. But he knows. But obviously we can look over the last 1900 years and see that the body has not been close enough to being ready. A lot of problems, a lot of trials, a lot of divisions, a lot of uh, messy, messianic movements and doctrines that are still of men and not of the Most High. Now if we jump down to verse 8 of Revelation 19, the very next verse, it says, And to hear it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, referring to the bride, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts. Notice that, acts or works, not just faith alone. Faith is important. You can't please him without faith, but faith alone without acts and works and obedience, as James chapter 2 makes it even more clear, is, is not worth a whole lot to our Creator. But these are the righteous acts of the saints. Well, who are the saints? Well, the Catholics might claim who they know who the saints are, and others might claim, but let's look at Scripture. According to the same author here of the book of Revelation, chapter 14, says, Here is the patience 
of the saints. Okay, here's the saints. Here's their patience. Here are those who keep the commandments of Elohim. Or if you prefer that holy Hebrew name, the yud heh vav -Hey. But if I say Yah, we say Hallelujah in just about every religion of Christianity and Judaism at least. I don't have a problem saying Yah. And the faith of Yeshua. By the King James, and most English translations say Jesus. That's the more common name. And I have an etymology teaching on YouTube, the etymology of Jesus, for anyone who's interested in, in how it's uh, gone from Greek to Latin to Old English to Modern English. It becomes what it is today. And many are wanting to restore the old school, the first century faith, including the names as well, which is wonderful. But nevertheless, let's jump over to Matthew chapter 22. Picking up in verse 8, it says, Then he said to his servants, this is our Messiah Yeshua, giving a parable, he says, The wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. And notice I put in there, not ready. It's very synonymous. If you're not worthy, then you're not ready. Very synonymous. Jumping down to verse 9, Therefore, go into the highways, and may I add the byways here, and in many, as many as you can find, invite to the wedding. And that's what these feasts are about, like rehearsals, especially these fall feasts, with the second coming of the Messiah, when that wedding takes place. Verse 10, so those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all whom they found, both bad and good. Oh, okay, some bad ones too. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. Verse 11, But when the king came in to see the guests, he saw a man there who did not have a wedding garment. Obviously, he wasn't ready, wasn't dressed ready for the wedding. Verse 12, so he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Now, of course, we do not want to be speechless. Followed by weeping and gnashing of teeth. You can read about in verse 13 and onward. I don't want to get too negative here, but this is for those who are going to keep the feast, especially with us in Yosemite this year to emphasize the importance of the theme and how it's also a very broad topic to cover a lot of issues, anything that's going to help us become more ready according to Scripture. But jumping over to Matthew chapter 25, it says in picking up in verse 6, it says, And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out and meet him. Verse 7, Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And, you know, in the context, this is the ten virgins, five wise ones, five foolish ones. In verse 8, it says, The foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamp is going out. But the wise answered and said, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. Now notice there, there's a need to obtain our own oil. We have to go to those who do. And who is the who that we need to go to that is selling the oil? Of course, not humanity here. This is where we have to build our own relationship with our Maker. As the Apostle Shaul, Paul, wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And you can't pay and go and work out anybody else's, but you can do your own. you got to do it for yourself. 
and help others the best you can. We can all influence and help others. Yes, that's laying down our lives for others. We need to be servants in doing that. But when it comes down to it, at the end of the day, we have to give an account for ourselves and not blame others. And we can't cover other people's issues. And, and so this, this parable about the wise ones not being able to give to the foolish ones is not being selfish. It's not saying, well, I'm not going to lay down my life and, sac- and do, be a living sacrifice. It's not that. It's just like we can't. We can't give oil to someone else. We can help and we can pray and we can guide and lead others and influence others with the right kind of peer pressure, not the wrong kind. But at the end of the day, we have to work out our own. Getting back to Matthew 25 here in verse 10, it says, And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready, there's that word ready, went in with him to the wedding. you got to have your garments on, and they need to be white linen, as other scriptures show, white being symbolic of righteousness, and linen is a, is a pure, wonderful fabric as well. Nevertheless, in verse 10, it says, And the door will be shut. Verse 11, Afterwards, the other virgins, and notice they're virgins, okay, they're virgins, they have some purity, and uh, but not enough. Physical virginity is not good enough either. We have to be spiritual, not your lukewarm, as we see the lukewarm ones. Even that is not quite ready. They need to buy their gold, refine in the fire. Nevertheless, verse 11, getting back to this here. Afterward, the other virgins came and also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Kind of reminds me of Noah. When, uh, when the ark was shut and people were wanting to be saved then, they didn't want to be saved beforehand, but for some reason when it came down to truly life and death, they wanted to be saved. They didn't really want to believe beforehand. It's very similar. It doesn't say in the book of Luke, like in the days of Noah, Luke chapter 17, so shall it be, and the Son of Man will be revealed. Nevertheless, getting back to Matthew 25, here it says, verse 12, But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Which reminds me of Matthew 7, verses 21 to 23, where it says, Many will come to him in that day. And he'll say he didn't know them because they practiced lawlessness or Torahlessness. And so the lukewarm ones will be keeping Torah, but very lukewarmly. So lukewarm that he really won't know them either. They'll be one of the five foolish virgins, along with any others, like Sardis and others, who are not repenting and overcoming. So verse 13 of Matthew 25, it says, Watch, therefore. Reminds me of Luke chapter 21, verse 34, which I will get to later on in this video more detail, but he says, For you know neither the day nor the hour which the Son of Man is coming. Often you'll see Son of God, Son of Yah, or Son of Man in the Scriptures. He's talking about the same individual. If we move on to Matthew 7.21, since that was mentioned earlier, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So it's beyond just the letter of the law or the Torah, but the will. What is his will? What can we see in Scripture or being revealed to us through his Spirit is his will for us. You've got to be careful not to go against his will. What is the ideal of goals and results and decisions that we should make in every decision? We make daily the righteous acts of the saints. We need to be doing righteous decisions. Uh, verse 22 of, of Matthew 7 here says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders, we can say miracles, in your name? Oh yeah, they're doing wonderful things in the name 
in his name or in anything that represents him, regardless of terminology. He says in verse 23, And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Is that word it can also be translated. I translate as Torahlessness. Law, nomos is the Greek word without it to, the, to one degree or another. They're representing him and they're doing great miracles even in his name, but they're not keeping his Torah as they should. Verse 24 says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken unto him as a man who builds his house on a rock. Like in Yosemite, you'll see a lot of big rocks, like even mountains like El Capitan and Half Dome, and there's cathedrals, and, and many others. Wonderful. But he is the ultimate rock. So as it says in Luke chapter 21, verse 36, it says, Watch, therefore. This is how we can become more ready. And pray always that we may be counted worthy. Not a guarantee, just because you believe that we may be counted worthy of all these things that will come to pass, the horrible, whatever, catastrophic, deadly things that will be coming on, on the most of the population of this earth, that we can stand before the Son of Man. There we are, talking about the Messiah again. It's all about Him, and so is the feast day. The feast day of to coat that we're going to be having this theme for him. Picturing a thousand year millennium. And we'll discuss that and where, where we get that conclusion when we're there with more meat and due season. But as the Apostle Yochanan, or John, also writes about knowing him, if you want to know him, a lot of people claim they know Jesus. I got a relationship with Jesus. I don't have to keep that law. I don't have to keep any commandments. So what, how, if the law is supposed to be written in our hearts, how does that mean we don't have to keep them? Apply that to any of the Ten Commandments. You know, the nine of them are obvious. One of them, people just say it's Jewish, but it's not. Look at the scriptures. It's, it's it. Leviticus 23 says all these feasts, these are his feasts. He, said, he says, and I'm quoting him now, these are my feet, my his, I'm speaking for him here, uh, to glorify him and his feet days. But doesn't it also say in Matthew 24, 20, to pray that your flight be not on a Sabbath day. That's a command there that, that we should be trying to keep the Sabbath the best we can. And in the winter is hard too because it's too cold for hiding out and, and traveling and people trying to catch you and take you into prison and persecute you. It's going to be a difficult time. And you don't want it to be on any of the Sabbaths or during really cold or even too hot a weather. I guess we can add that as well. But obviously it's going to be a difficult time. Nevertheless, here in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 7, if you want to know him, he says, And by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Now some will say, well, yeah, I'll keep Jesus' commandments, but I don't need those older ones. Well, Jesus a different God? Is he, is he somebody else? Does he not represent the Father? Is he different than the Father in any way? Christians look at the scripture as if Jesus is somebody else. A different God or a different being that, that doesn't re represent the Father. The both commandments. This is the whole, talking about the whole word of God. Of course, the word of Yah we see in the New Testament and the Old Testament, as most people refer to it. I like to refer to it as the Tanakh and the Brit Hadashah. It's one holy book, one holy Bible. 
And getting back to 1 John 2 here, and picking up in verse 5, we just read 3 and 4. It says, But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of Yah is perfected in him. By this we know we are in him. This is how we know. Verse 6, He who says he abides in him ought to himself or herself also to walk just as he walked. And I'll be doing a teaching on walking with Yah. How do we do that? Very obvious. You can't do it without the commandments, without obedience and dependence. As it seems most Christians don't want to hear much about those topics. But verse 7, we're not talking about some just New Testament commandments here. This was written before the New Testament was even written or canonized centuries later. Notice verse 7, the apostle says, Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have heard from the beginning. Okay, let's get back to Genesis. The beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. If you go to Deuteronomy 30, right there around uh, verses uh, 10 through 14, you see commandment singular, commandment plural, referring to the entire written Torah, all the commandments that apply to humanity and as should apply not just in the land of Israel, but the ones that apply throughout the whole earth, including his Sabbaths and feast days, as we see in, in Isaiah 66, verses 22 and 23, even with a new heavens and a new earth, all flesh is going to come before him, not just the Jewish people, not just Israel. And so we need to understand what applies to everywhere. Some just apply to Levites. Yep, I'm not a Levite, as far as I know. Uh, some apply to just women, some apply to just men, that are very specific. But some apply to all. And it takes a little bit of logic and revelation to figure that out. And, and it's a walk that we're all walking to become more ready. It's not easy in the sense that the mankind likes to complicate everything. And people don't want to obey the Most High in, in every way that we should. So we like to cherry pick what we want to call moral or not, and, and so forth. But it's all about loving Him, loving the Most High. And so we need to realize for about 2,000 years now, actually, the bride has not been getting ready enough, hasn't been ready enough. Still not ready yet. Perhaps we still have a long way to go. I hope have more time to improve. There's a lot of need for improvement in this state, in this walk, in this movement, as many refer to as Hebrew roots, some refer to Messianic, and there's a lot of different titles in, in the last 2,000 years of history of, of leaders and movements that have been restoring the Ten Commandments, all ten, plus the feast days and whatever else, uh, the, the clean and unclean food and meat laws that are in uh, Leviticus that the New Testament doesn't water down or do away with at all. It's simply misunderstanding. And so he, as the bride gets ready, we need to understand our own scriptures more accurately. The, the, the parables that are not to be taken hyper-literally. The metaphors. The allegories. There's hidden meanings in the scriptures. As we see in Proverbs 25, verse 2, it is to his glory, to our Creator's glory, to hide matters. That Hebrew word for matters is devar. It's like devarim. You see, that's the book of Deuteronomy, the book of, of words. It can be translated in a number of different ways, but it, he likes to hide truth in words. So there's homonyms and homographs. Heteronyms, I've talked about those in every language, which is why it's difficult to interpret the scriptures accurately in perfect unity unless we really want perfect unity and to overcome our prejudice 
and to keep whatever commandments he wants us to keep, it gets simplified as we can unify the interpretation to not create contradictions in the scriptures. And so that's why I have a YouTube video teaching titled Multiple Choice Interpretation, which reveals a lot of that detail. There are still too many doctrines and commandments of men, of humans. I mean, and understand in ancient Greek and in Hebrew is a masculine, feminine language, like a lot of the Romance languages, that a lot of times when it says sons or men, it's, it's including women, as you do in a masculine, feminine language. English is more of a unisex language and uni unified terms, but um, we'll explain that more in detail for anyone who has questions or interests either at the feast or before or after or in video teachings, we want to get the whole counsel of Yah out there, all the truth, as we learn and as we grow. As baby steps, we're learning and growing. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I have it all right. But I'm learning and growing as I go, and I just love to share as I do. As, as the bride's getting ready, we should still have time to invite others and get ready. Let's get more ready than we were last year and in previous years. Let's learn and grow like we need a yeshiva of learning and growing, getting better each year. As, as the wedding rehearsals, we have these rehearsals every year, working on improving our walk and our steps in unity with him. Often in a lot of weddings, you got to get your steps right. you got to practice those steps. If there's a certain way to go up the aisle this way, every wedding is different. And some are more laid back and easygoing. Others are more formal and strict. But whatever he wants us to get in alignment with, that's what we need to focus on, on scripture, not just doctrines of men, tachanot or ma'asim of men, doctrines and traditions of men, but really what does the word say? How are we to apply it to our lives? These are some areas we can learn and grow as time allows, become more accurate, to hopefully improve each year in unity as one body to boost and, and to beat to the beat of his drum. I may use that idiom. There's also idioms in scripture. To the beat of his drum, not our drum. And to learn and grow together. Yes, it is quite a broad feast theme. And I like it that way, so we're not restricted to anything too narrow. But we will not run out of relevant topics and things to talk about or to learn. To continually, spiritually mature and walk more accurately and faithfully with our Maker and with each other. With Him and each other as one body, as one bride. With daily Interactive teaching with questions and answer, Q&A, a fervent praying together or on your own out in nature or, or by yourself, praising and worshiping together, fellowshipping together, as well as plenty of rejoicing out in some of the most majestic locations of the Most High's creation. Not divisively debating, please don't get me wrong, I, not trying to recruit debaters and people that like to get hot and heated and divisive and, and hold grudges against one another for having any disagreements, but with maximum shalom and agape to pursue this goal as iron sharpening iron love and respect one another. That's what I want to promote here and with a, like a yeshiva and learning as we get into different topics that are relative getting ready for that wedding, for everyone peaceful and respectful, along with iron sharpening iron, as, as, as it says in Proverbs chapter 27, 17. And iron sharpens iron, and so do a friend con sharpen the countenance of his friend. And we're to be friends and family. And yes, when iron sharpening iron, often, sometimes, sparks do fly. Yeah, there'll be some sparks flying here and there. We don't have to agree on everything. But here a little, there a little. We can still learn and grow and agree to differ and just respect 
one another's desire to live by every word that we believe is inspired, and we even though we might understand it a little bit differently. To always remember 1 Corinthians 13. What's that, right? The love chapter. Everyone knows it as the love chapter because it says that you can have all knowledge. You can know all doctrines and know all mysteries and prophecies, but if you don't have love for one another, it's not worth anything to him. And so we don't want just knowledge and head knowledge to, to be a higher priority, but we don't want to ditch it either and downplay it. We want to just learn and grow and try to learn from one another, but in love. We say agape is the Greek word which is more than just brotherly love. It's more than just that romantic, eros, Greek type of love. This is, agape is the, 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 the love that our Creator has with humans and humans back to Him, and it applies equally to humans laterally around each other. So it goes up and down to Him and us, and also around us and wherever we look. To never exclude His his love, which always includes his commandments.